I want to thank again the Center for Humanities Center for hosting us and Eric for being such a wonderful host. Roland, thank you so much for having us here. So as Tanisha mentioned in our first session this morning, we'll be publishing um, volume eight of the King Papers Project and volume eight uh, will we'll cover 1963. And since we're covering Birmingham today, I wanted to share a brief portion of a speech that we will be publishing um, that my colleagues have worked so hard getting together um, from a recording of a, a mass address that King offered during the Birmingham campaign. The headline is Address Delivered at a Mass Meeting at St. James Baptist Church on April 10th of 1963. This is exactly seven days into the Birmingham campaign. And then after the first week, 139 protesters have been arrested for sit-ins including 27 on April 10th alone. So this is what King says in the evening of uh, mass meeting at St. James Baptist Church. Thank you very kindly, my dear friends and co-workers of this mighty struggle for freedom. We are having a marvelous time here in Birmingham, and I want to say publicly what a great pleasure it has been for me to work with your illustrious president for these few days that we have been here in Birmingham. You know, it's not been easy to sit down with anybody in tension-packed days like these, and in decision-demanding days like these, when hour after hour and moment after moment we are caught up in great demand without, without, the, kind, without the kind of getting upset and nervousness and blowing off. But I can say, where these days with President, President Shuttlesworth have been fruitful and peaceful and brotherly at every point. And it has been a great experience to work with all the members of the board this great, in this great organization. We are proud to have the opportunity to serve Birmingham, and that is why we are here. We are not here to do anything for you. We are here to do something with you. And I believe that the job is going to be done because we are going to work hard to do it. Now, there are two or three things that we must do if this job is going to get done. We have asked every freedom-loving Negro of self-respect of Birmingham, Alabama, to refuse to shop in these stores downtown or on the shopping centers around the town. And we're only buying food and medicine. These are certain necessities that we must have. But we are asking everybody to live a sacrificial life during this Easter season and even after the Easter season. Now you see that we have on our blue jeans and we have on our gray work shirts and we are not wearing these merely to engage in some theatrical gesture. We are wearing them to symbolize our determination to sacrifice during this period. We are wearing them to symbolize the fact that we are not going to buy suits or shirts or shoes or socks or anything in the downtown area of Birmingham, Alabama until the walls of segregation in these stores come crumbling down. And we intend to keep on keeping on until that job is done. Now we're asking you, my friends, not only to stop buying, your, buying for yourselves, but to tell your neighbor. And when you see any Negro shopping downtown, realize that that Negro doesn't have any self-respect. And he isn't fit to be free. Now, of course, there may be some people who don't know. There may be some, a few people who haven't heard about our protest. But I think the vast majority of Negroes have heard about this movement. And that means that anybody who goes downtown to shop is going in defiance of this movement. And they are traitors to the Negro race. Yes. Not the Martin King we're used to hearing. That's right. To help us think through this today, in our last panel, we have Dr. Adam Banks, who's a professor at Stanford's Graduate School of Education and faculty director of the program in writing and rhetoric. Dr. Banks' interests include African American rhetoric, community literacy, digital rhetorics, and digital humanities. He's the author of the Digital Griots, African American Rhetoric in a Multimedia Age. But, as he likes to remind people, he's an avid teacher and a slow jammer and a hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> All right now. 
<laughs> Next, we have Dr. James Campbell, himself, I'm sure, a slow dancer and a hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> Edgar E. Robinson, professor of United States history here at Stanford. Dr. Campbell is the author of Middle Passages, African American Journeys to Africa, and Songs of Zion, the African Methodist Episcopal Church in the United States and South Africa. Our dear brother who opened us up uh, yesterday, Jonathan E. is here, New York Times bestselling author of several books, including, of course, King A Life, who I mentioned yesterday, his book was mentioned on Barack Obama's summer reading list, which also, I think, has hip hop and hands on. <laughs> <laughs> and closing us out, we have Ansley Kiros, who's here with us. And let me make sure I work. <laughs> Enzi Kiros is Associate Professor of History at the University of North Alabama. She's the author of God With Us, Lived Theology and the Freedom Struggle in America's Georgia. Currently, Dr. Kiros is working on two projects, a spiritual biography of Charles and Shirley Sherrod, and an examination of Freaknik. <laughs> and like the Freak Party. Not a lot of slow jams. Not a lot of slow jams at Freaknik. No, 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 no. It's just for the handsome, yeah. It's yeah. hip hop world. It's hip hop world. So with that, we'll get started. Adam's going to kick us off. And again, we'll have our presentation. We'll go for about 10 minutes or so. Then we'll open up for conversation. Thank you. Brother. I want to make sure I don't run out of juice here, so I'm going to plug up. So uh, along with being uh, or naming myself a slow jam in the hip hop world, uh, ever since I read James Combs, The Spirituals and the Blues, and he opens that book uh, talking about the juke joint, I've also seen myself as both Saturday night and Sunday morning, <laughs> which may or may not bear on my few comments here today. Uh, so a few of my friends, when they want to clown me, including my mentor, Professor Keith Gilliard, uh, I want to say his name, they, they say something along the lines of, A.B. can't even clear his throat in 10 minutes. But, <laughs> Despite that, <laughs> I'm going to try to keep the announcements in mind and govern myself accordingly. <laughs> uh, Professor Martin, my brother, thank you so much for the invitation, and thanks to everyone who worked so hard to organize and put this on. I want to look back a bit before we look forward and say, given that everything that we're seeing in this era of racist recalcitrance, I feel more in the spirit of King's A Knock at Midnight sermon from 62 than in the spirit of the Birmingham campaign. But I appreciate the, the opportunity to offer a thought or two on what that campaign uh, means for us in the broader Black freedom movement in, in today's uh, moments and movements toward freedom and liberation. And so uh, as a preface and kind of related to the question I asked Aisha this morning, I want to say that I continually marvel at the ways that black people keep faith in this country and have kept faith in what this country can be, despite almost all of the available evidence. The persistence of that faith is what feeds movements like the Birmingham campaign and the insistence of black people with and without broader networks of allies to make a way out of no way, uh, or what I'm going to say, especially given my role you know, as a rhetorician and someone who, you know, on my better days, teaches rhetoric here, um, create a rhetorical situation where none exists. And rhetorical situation, that's one of those phrases we use in, in, in my area. Uh, but as a matter of fact, I might say, I was going to switch to a uh, poster here or a, an image. I may put it up later for us. I might say that the African-American rhetorical situation in this country can be distilled in a sign and a line. The sign, which I have right here, but we'll plug it up later, is a sister holding up uh, a sign saying, I cannot believe I still have to protest this shit. <laughs> sign and a line. Sign, the line being Ms. Lauren Hills, tell me who I have to be to get some reciprocity. Yeah. This was the case in Birmingham and Ferguson and Baltimore and movements all over the country in the last almost decade since Tamir Rice's murder in my hometown and all of the moments where we've had to say her name, say their names. 
I'm focused on the rhetorical work of the Birmingham campaign and of movements in this contemporary moment, despite the ways that so many people understand rhetoric as a pejorative, because of the ways black people in this society have steadfastly attempted to use reason in unreasonable situations, have attempted to appeal, uh, to, appeal to members of this society. Since we had Malcolm invoked earlier, Malcolm also said, yeah, I'm paraphrasing, that it's madness to try to appeal to someone, you know, to, to make a moral appeal to people with no morality. Um, and ways that they have always focused on figuring it out rather than fighting it out. Now, there are a whole lot of debates in the tradition about that, too. Let's be clear. Henry McNeil Turner, so many more. We can bring it forward, right? And yet, that desire to figure it out rather than fight it out has always prevailed among the masses. So within these 10 minutes, I want to focus my remarks on that continual lack of rhetorical situation of black movements, insistence, and persistence encountering it. When we talk about rhetorical situation in my work, what we mean, what I mean is a scenario where persuasion is at least possible, where parties are in dialogue in good faith and, and at least willing to be persuaded. And when I say the black people when pressing for systemic change to remedy present and past injustice have no rhetorical situation, but have tried to make one anyway. Yes, I'm talking about the terror that was endemic to both legal and extra legal responses to organized protest. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the ways that even the most plaintive of pleas and the most assertive stances in protest got the same response. I know you all know this, but I want to underscore it. I was take a minute to think about just how apoplectic much of the nation got over a man taking a knee yeah. on the ball field. Yeah. And of people asking, pleading, hands up, don't shoot. So with what I'm saying is something nowhere close to a rhetorical situation, yet insistent on using persuasive rhetorical means to press for freedom, for justice, for equality, what links Birmingham to today? A short answer would be in the creative uses of media across those whole 60 years. And that short answer could be the subject of entire graduate seminars. Can't get a graduate seminar in 10 minutes, right? So, and y'all all graduate educated anyway. <laughs> but a down payment on the longer answer lies partially in William's comment earlier. MLK sent out a tweet and said, meet me in Washington. <laughs> to put it differently, I want to spend the few minutes I have left. On, don't let me become one of the preachers, y'all, as I prepare to close. Please, you already know I ain't got no sense. Please don't. Um, <laughs> but let me spend these last few minutes on connections between Fred Shuttlesworth and Black Twitter in the Black rhetorical tradition. Because it was Shuttlesworth and his comrades who invited King to Birmingham, I want to make sure we put some respect on his name yes. before we get to the social media landscape of protest and organizing in the last decade. And the main point I want to make, when so many study the rhetoric that made the movements move, paraphrasing another well-known line from Shuttlesworth, is that we need to study the everyday just as much as the elevated and the elegiac. We need to study the everyday just as much as the elevated and the elegiac. Many people see Shuttlesworth, those who study him, as at the opposite end of a continuum with King rhetorical. That, that first paragraph that, that, that we had my man uh, Lerone give us in that speech from April 63, right? King's, King's intros are just, you know, beautiful and, 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 and powerful. Shuttlesworth was seen as uh, at an opposite end of that. You know, where we teach King's speeches and sermons and books, one, not a lot of people teaching Shuttlesworth explicitly. They teach his role in the movement, but they don't necessarily teach him as a rhetor. Shuttlesworth was known for being a brilliant improviser and excelling, uh, excelling in off-the-cuff moments. He was known as being stellar with the story and quick with the quip or the turn of phrase that could turn an entire conversation. Just one example of a line that King used often that came from Shuttlesworth. Some of you all already know this. My historians are there. 
We have taken the bull out of old bull Connor and made a steer out of him. <laughs> we don't hear that line attached to Shuttlesworth as much. Shuttlesworth was also described at, by some, and this gets to the everyday in Black rhetorical traditions, uh, including my colleague David Holmes as Ryball. He cites Calvin Woods from uh, ACMHR in, in, in that description. But let me just give one example of how Shuttlesworth could turn a phrase bringing the best of Black vernacular rhetorical traditions to the mass meeting moment. In the presiding remarks he gave at a mass meeting on April 25th, 1963, just a couple weeks after your moment, he said, but segregation has a way of making folks leave off certain things in order to get at certain points. I said that the unwritten rule has been that if the mob don't stop the Negroes, the police can. And if the police can't, the courts will. And that's exactly what they're trying to do now. Some of y'all hear that they try to do now. Uh, Geneva Smitherman on the case there. But, and we, the Negroes, have learned that we substitute another M for M, marshals for mob. Shuttlesworth's wit and its sources have an analog 60 years later in Black Twitter. And yes, I'm still saying Black Twitter, despite a certain CEO's attempt to rebrand it. <laughs> Mama name it Twitter, I'm going to call it Twitter. <laughs> but when we think about Ferguson and St. Louis and Louisville and cities all over the country and the activism we've seen in this last decade, activists in this era have used the media of the moment as shrewdly as King and his contemporaries used radio to announce the mass movement, sometimes in code, use television, even changing the format of television news in the 60s. And it's everyday language, vernacular rhetorical practices that powered this social media brilliance, just as it did Shuttlesworth's mass meeting rhetoric. Meredith Clark, one of and probably the foremost authority on this phenomenon, she definitely is for me, Define Black Twitter, and I'm quoting here, as a temporarily linked group of connectors that share culture, language, and interest, talking about specific topics with a Black frame of reference. And she notes that this is not just Black people in the U.S., but worldwide. Here's my assertion, building on Dr. Clark. Black users turn Twitter into simultaneously Hush Harbor, Lyceum, Public Square, and space for counter public interrogations and interventions that at times even served as something akin to the mass meetings of the Birmingham campaign and other elements of the broader black freedom movement. I know I need to close. <laughs> but let me just describe a few of the elements of the everyday rhetorical work on black Twitter that made it so crucial to community building and to movement building. Despite the surveillance networks that marked both the civil rights movement and activist campaigns in this last decade, users on Black Twitter spoke in plain view, knowing, as they say in the vernacular, tweets is watching. <laughs> that communication ranged from the hushed to the hyperbolic and constantly invoked both call and response and signifying. These practices and the fact that people knew and understood them as tools for building online community, even when Tweets is watching, enabled a lot of the organizing that followed that fostered action in cities all over the country and the ability to intervene in news media framing of black issues that would have been either ignored outright or minimized, despite the atrocities that were also happening in plain view. We know the difficulty of penetrating national discourse when it comes to black concerns like those that framed the demands of the March on Washington that we talked about earlier in the work of the Birmingham campaign. We know that will remain because of a deep and pervasive white incredulity. We know that surveillance systems will only intensify as our saturation in various kinds of technologies increases. You see that even not knowing what the social media landscape is going to be even in a few years, but there will be one. The surveillance on it will be there. But we also know that no matter how, black people often have nothing like a true rhetorical situation in order to press for redress or make any kind of protest or demands. Making a rhetorical way out of no way 
will depend every bit as much on everyday vernacular rhetorical practices as on the elevated text we teach. The vernacular matters every bit as much as the exemplar, no matter the movement, no matter the technologies involved, and, and as a way of closing all of that off, we all know King liked the pool hall as much as he likes the podium. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, um, all right. I, uh, I have some follow up. <laughs> Thank you to everybody. Uh, I also, uh, I used the phrase about can't clear the throat in 10 minutes about myself. <laughs> and, um, so I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to, I also have a bone to pick with yesterday's people on the panel. Uh, because when I was asked to participate in a round table, Thought, okay, I'll get a few thoughts together and then we'll have a conversation. And then four people in a row stood up, now five, <laughs> and gave absolutely brilliant prepared talks. And so I was sitting here yesterday thinking, oh crap. <laughs> and, um, the problem's made worse because I got to do. Can you help me with this? Is it. Is it uh, but it is plugged in. I guess I have to um, yeah, open your, your screens. Open your thing. Be able to open your slides. Can somebody else just <laughs> over there on the left. So, uh, in any event, I am um, I'm writing a book about 1964, uh, and uh, I don't talk very much about 1963. Um, but I just, as it happens, have been writing the one chapter of the book that actually is largely about 1963. So, what I'm going to try to do today. I think it might be mirror screens, could it be? You need to open your, maybe on whatever you want to present. It's hanging over for a second there. Unplug it, and then just launch your slideshow. Yeah. Sorry. Would you launch your slideshow? Yeah, go to your slideshow. Oh, it's there. I think maybe if I drag it. Yeah. There you go. You're slow dance. Slow dance. That's right. Slow dance. I don't know. I think that was a spot. It's a formatting issue. Displays. Um, displays. So what I'm writing about, and I'll show a few slides about this, I'm writing a book in some ways about its starting point is the murder of three civil rights workers in Philadelphia, Mississippi in 19... That's it. That's it. For genius. <laughs> um, uh, in 1954, an inordinate amount of time in the Shope County over the last now almost 20 years. Um, and I think all of you nod and you'll know why Neshoba County is important. It was the location of one of the most grievous and uh, rem best remembered crimes of the civil rights era, the murder of three civil rights workers, uh, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney. Uh, in June of 1964, on the first day of Freedom Summer. I'm not writing about the murders per se, but about their reverberations, both about, it's a really a book about memory, exploring the reverberations of this event in the lives of people who were touched by it, from people in the town, movement of people, family members, and also in popular culture. Some of you will recognize this painting by Norman Rockwell, who I would imagine murder scene, some of you will remember Mississippi Burning, which is in fact one of four um, films that have now been made about this particular case. Uh, one that contrives to turn the two-fisted agents of the FBI into the true heroes of the civil rights movement. I said to one person once that um, 
The image on the FBI poster had had acquired the quality of a medieval triptych, mm -hmm. and that person sent me this. So clearly, wow. others have thought so as well. What I have today is uh, a chapter that is about three people. It's about Dave Dennis. Some of you will know Dave, who was a freedom writer. This is after his arrest. That's a picture of him uh, with the National Guard on the freedom rides, riding into Jackson, Mississippi. He, be he came out of New Orleans Corps. He became uh, chief field secretary and co-organizer of the Freedom Project. And if you've ever seen Eyes on the Prize or know much about the movement, the image on the right, you will know instantly, uh, one of the most searing moments in the entire movement, he delivered a funeral oration at James Cheney's funeral, in which he said to the people there, I'm tired of going to funerals. If you go home and say, oh, it was a good funeral, God damn your souls, it's time to stand up. It's time to stand up. The chapter is also about Carolyn Goodman, uh, Andrew Goodman's mother. This is an image of her and her husband, Robert, as the casket bearing uh, their son home lands at Newark Airport. And it's also about James Baldwin, and that's what we're talking about today. And it's a chapter about 100 days. And it's 100 days exactly between the, this document in which Carolyn Goodman signed a permission slip for her son Andy to participate in the summer project because he had not yet reached the minimum age of 21. And this day, when delegates of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, surrounded and defeated, returned to Mississippi from uh, Atlantic City for their efforts to be seated as the authentic representatives of the state of Mississippi's Democratic Party were defeated. Those 100 days, uh, I love stuff like this, are exactly the 100-day run of James Baldwin's one Broadway play, Blues for Mr. Charlie. When we think of Baldwin, we don't typically group him. I'm going to start reading now, because otherwise I'll... We don't usually think of him in the context of the civil rights movement, and it's well worth thinking about why. One of the reasons, and the one I wish to explore today, is because he rejected the basic premise of the mainstream movement. The assumption that, the Ameri that America's race problem, or at least as white people understood it, I should say, the assumption that America's race problem was anomalous, a historical blemish that could be smoothed by the ball. For Baldwin, the sickness ran far deeper and the cure was far more Born of a single mother in Harlem Hospital in 1924, Baldwin grew up in a household with eight step siblings, presided over by his stepfather, David Baldwin, whose surname became his own. Brooding, silent, tyrannical, he called him. David Baldwin was a storefront creature of morbid intensity, a fact that provided the inspiration for his first and most deeply autobiographical novel, A Tell on a Mountain, published in 19. At 14, Baldwin, tormented by his stepfather, racist schoolmates, and his own ambivalent sexuality, became a Pentecostalist preacher himself, what counts an extremely effective. But by the time he finished high school, he had left the church behind and embraced his calling as an artist. In a singular bit of synchrony, he buried his stepfather and celebrated his 19th birthday on the day of the Harlem race riot in 1943. Baldwin moved to Paris in 1920, in, at the age of 24, a decision he insisted that saved his life. Living in exile, he watched the beginnings of the modern movement from a distance. His first encounter with the movement and his first encounter with black life outside the urban north came in 1957, when he accepted an assignment from Partisan Review to travel through the American South and write about what he saw. But his real entry into the political fray had come a year earlier earlier, also in Partisan Review, in an essay entitled Faulkner and Desegregation, in which he introduced what would become the keynote, in my opinion, of all his nonfiction writing. Mm -hmm. The United States did not suffer a Negro thing, or a white mm -hmm. A deep-seated complex of fear, self-loathing, and panic lurking just beneath the surface of white American complacency. 
and denying the humanity of black people, white people, and surrender their own. The essay and partisan review was written in response to a series of statements Faulkner had made in early 56 in response to a court order ordering the desegregation of the University of Alabama. Having seen Southerners' responses to the recent Brown v. Board case, Faulkner feared that this further affront to the South would provoke defiance, perhaps another civil war. His solution, proposed in a short essay in Harper's and repeated in a published letter to the North in Life magazine a few weeks later, was simple. Go slow. Stop for a time. A moment. Far from advancing racial equality, he warned those insisting on, quote, immediate and unconditional integration were actually harming the cause by driving white Southerners of decency, reason, and moderation himself into the ranks of the reaction. In a notorious drunken interview sandwiched between the two essays, he made the point more belligerently. As long as the middle road, there's a middle road, all right, I'll be on it. But if it comes to fighting, I'd fight for Mississippi against the United States, even if it meant going out in the street and shooting Negroes. Faulkner was quick to disavow the interview. He said, by way of apology, these were statements which no sober man would make, it seems to me, any sane man believe. And Baldwin made no reference to it in his rejoinder. But the essay was no less devastating for that. In a series of withering paragraphs he identified Faulkner's logical flaws. The folly of defending a racial order that Faulkner himself acknowledged to be wrong and untenable, even silly. The naive belief that Southerners, again, these are all quotes, left to their own devices would end segregation of their own, evidenced by the fact, or that things were getting better, evidenced by the fact, again, these are Faulkner's words, that only six Negroes were killed by whites last year. Underlying the entire essay was a recognition of the profound challenge that the Black Freedom Movement posed to white Southerners and indeed to all Americans. As Baldwin wrote, any real change implies the breakup of the world as one has always known it, the loss of all that gave one an identity, the end of safety. And at such a moment, unable to see and not daring to imagine what the future will bring forth, one clings to what one knew or thought one knew, to what one possessed or dreamed that one possessed. In the end, however, he believed that it was only when humans surrendered such dreams, when they forswore safety and embraced the uncertainty of change, that they became free. Baldwin returned to the United States in May 1963, embarking on a lecture tour of the southern states on behalf of CORE, which he had formally joined a few years before. He was at the peak of his celebrity, having published three books in the previous three years. How about this? Another Country, his third novel, bracketed by Nobody Knows My Name and the Fire Next Time. On May 17th, he graced the cover of Time, the first black writer so recognized. The headline inside the magazine that the editors gave the story, The Root of the Negro Problem, must have made him choke. But the subtitle clarified his position. At the root of the Negro problem is the necessity of the white man to find a way of living with the Negro in order to live with himself. Baldwin's stature was affirmed a few days later when the office of U.S. Attorney General Robert Kennedy asked him to organize a meeting between Kennedy and a representative group of civil rights workers. Baldwin obliged assembling an eclectic delegation. In addition to his stepbrother David, the group included Harry Belafonte and Lena Horne, playwright Lorraine Hansberg, sociologist Kenneth Clark, uh, actor Rip Torn, who would later play the white lead in Blues for Mr. Charlie, as well as representatives of the NAACP and Urban League. Martin Luther King was conspicuous by his absence, but he was represented by one of his attorneys, God bless him, Clarence Jones, Jerome Smith, a founding member of the New Orleans Corps chapter, now working in Mississippi, represented the younger generation. The story of the meeting convened in the Kennedy family apartment on Central Park South has been told and retold countless times over the years, initially in competing press releases, later in memoirs, most recently in film documentaries, and a full-length theatrical production. A remarkable record given that the meeting was supposed to be off the record. <laughs> the conversation, according to Belafonte, began with the usual politesse until Jerome Smith began to speak. 
Smith had already endured countless arrests and assaults, including a brass knuckle beating on the steps of the county courthouse in Macomb, Mississippi, an assault observed by the officers of Kennedy's Justice Department, who stood nearby taking notes. It was as if he'd suffered some kind of traumatic flashback, or Lance Jones, and indeed he may have. Well into his 80s, Smith continued to experience headaches and other symptoms of that beating. He just bared his soul and all his pain, denouncing American policy in Cuba, in Vietnam, and elsewhere. Kennedy, visibly unsettled, looked to others in the room to bring Smith to heal. And I'm sorry, I just realized that this slide is slightly out of joint, but I'm not going to mess with it. <laughs> Lorraine Hansberry wouldn't have it. You've got a great many men a very, great, very, very, very accomplished people in this room, she said to Kennedy, but the only man you should be listening to is that man right there. Trying a different tack, Kennedy ordered, offered the story of his own Irish immigrant forebears who had also endured segregation <laughs> before arriving in America. But that line was cut short by David Baldwin, who proudly observed that his family had also come to America from overseas. <laughs> <early>. <laughs> <laughs> Hours and several minutes later, the meeting disbanded. <coughs> conclusions from that first encounter. For Kennedy, it evidenced the fundamental irrationality of some elements within the movement. They don't know what they've been doing or what they're trying to do, he complained to an ad. It was all emotion, hysteria. They stood up and orated, they cursed. Some of them wept and left the room. Following the meeting, he placed a call to J. Edgar Hoover ordering him to begin or intensify surveillance on several meeting participants, including Baldwin. For black participants, the prospect was even more distressing. If Robert Kennedy and his brother John were indeed, quote, the best that a white American can offer, Lorraine Hansberry wrote, then what hope was there? I had a feeling of complete futility, she wrote to him. As we got on the elevator, I wondered if there was ever any way to make the white people of this country understand. Conceived in hope and ending in disillusionment, the Kennedy meeting was a prologue to Baldwin's 63 Southern Letter. Everywhere he traveled, he saw signs of new determination and possibility, as well as signs of white incomprehension and transgenders. In Birmingham, here you see him at a fundraiser in Birmingham. He saw children brave fire hoses and police dogs. In Jackson, he formed a deep bond with Medgar Evers, who was spearheading an unprecedented black boycott of downtown white businesses. But he invested the greatest share of his time and the lion's share of his hope in the student. For Baldwin, it was this rising generation of young activists forged in the crucible of the sit-ins and freedom rides and operating under the auspices of Snake and Core, who posed the most fundamental challenge to the racial order. Not simply because they defied segregation, but because they defied a racist society's of def of definition of what a Negro was. Forever chasing again, chafing against his own emotional and psychological shackles, Baldwin saw in the students an exhilarating vision of freedom. He cherished their company. That's him with the uh, Forest uh, Castle. Uh, often staying up at night to drink and argue with. He grew particularly close to a group of young core workers out of Mississippi, to Jerome Smith, Dave Dennis, Doris and Orthy Castle, George Raymond, Mat Mateo Suarez, most of whom later ended up in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. On more than one occasion, he missed his flight, but such was, such was his celebrity, he just chartered a new flight and went on to his speaking <laughs> engagement. The 63 was a season of hope. And here you see him, we had reference to Charlton Heston yesterday, with Marlon Brando and Charlton Heston at the March on Washington. It was also a season of cruel frustration and bitter loss. Two weeks after his visit to Jackson, Medgar Evers was cut down by an assassin. Two weeks after the March on Washington, a bomb ripped through Birmingham 16th Baptist Church. And if you haven't seen it, I imagine most people have here, that's an image of the stained glass window in the church after the bomb did it, with Christ's face blown out. The civil rights movement that John Kennedy had introduced with such fanfare was quickly bogged down. 
And this was the context in which Baldwin wrote Blues for Mr. Charlie. By his own account, he was still in Europe when he conceived the idea and the title, and you all will recognize the meaning of Mr. Charlie. But the bulk of the play was written during his 63 tours, gribbled in his words on pads and trains, planes, gas stations, and the spare, meeting, spare moments between civil rights meetings and appearances. The plot follows a young black man, Richard Henry, who returns to his small southern hometown after living years in Chicago. Ignoring the admonitions of his father, Meridian, a humble, long-suffering minister, he clashes with a brutal, right, racist white storekeeper, played by Rip Torn, who murders him and then is acquitted by an all-white jury. The debt to the 1955 murder of Emmett Till was obvious, but the play was in every sense a product of 1963. Its dedication, quote, to the memory of Medgar Evers and, the widow, and his widows and his widow and children, and to the memory of the dead children of Burma. The climactic scene of Act Two, when Meridian Henry, standing over the coffin of his slave, slain son, delivers not a lament, but a battle cry. What shall we tell our children, he cries, learn to walk again like men, like men. After endless revisions, Blues for Mr. Charlie opened on Broadway in April 1964 at the Actors Studio. To the surprise of all involved, it flopped. Producers set ticket prices low in hopes of attracting both white and black patrons, but sales lagged. By early June, it was in danger of closing. Baldwin turned to friends and colleagues to keep it alive. Composer Bobby Sharp recorded and released a theme song, a dirge-like jazz number, also titled Blues for Mr. Charlie to raise money. The New York chapter of CORE contributed a pair of sound trucks, which patrolled the five boroughs touting the play. A donation of $10,000 from Norman uh, Nelson Rockefeller's daughters covered costs for an extra two weeks, but audience stayed away, and the production closed in late August. Critical note notices were mixed. Some praised the play for its fierce energy and passion, but also slighted it for its hackneyed plot. The theater critic of the New York Times opined, quote, Mr. Baldwin knows how the Negroes think and, think and feel, but his inflexible Negro-hating Southerners are stereotypes. He added with no intended irony, Southerners may talk and behave as he suggests, but in the theater they are caricatures. What is one to do with a, such a criticism? Leaving aside the irony, protesting against stereotypical white characters in theater. What does it actually mean to say that characters are true to life but unpersuasive on the stage? As for the Hackney plot, which stands out in light of the murders that occurred in, occurred in Neshoba County halfway through the run, is its eerie prescience. Right down to the name of the minister, Meridian, which was also the hometown of James Kane, as well as the clansman who killed him. All of the elements of Baldwin's drama were restaged in Neshoba County. The fear aroused by the arrival of outsiders, the violence of ignorant, almost comically racist men, the feckless hand-wringing of the decent white folks so hollowed out and fearful that they were incapable of doing what they knew to be right. They even produced a climactic funeral oration in Meridian of all places in which a gentle, soft-spoken man cast aside lamentations. I'm a journalist, so I'll keep, definitely keep it under 10 minutes. <laughs> I'd like to suggest and discuss the idea that perhaps the Birmingham campaign was king at his most effective. We've heard just in the past two days some of the impact of Birmingham, how it paved the way for the greatest peaceful demonstration in American history, how it created a blueprint for organizing that's still in use today, 
how it made possible the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, how it solidified engagement of the labor movement, accidentally perhaps energized women's activists, women activists, and um, led to at least a temporary increase in the minimum wage. I could go on. Um, but I'd like to think instead about why this was King's most effective moment. Um, and before I give you my theory, um, and I'll tell you that I do not agree with JFK that the credit belongs to Bull Connor. Um, sure. I'd just like to tell you a little story. One of the people who was watching on television during the Birmingham campaign was a woman named Francine Yeager, a Chicago girl, 19 years old. And I interviewed her for my book. Um, after watching what went on in Birmingham, she's a, a black girl uh, working part-time at a grocery store while she was attending community college. She felt like she had to do something. At age 19, she felt like she had to respond to King's call. Now, this is a girl who grew up in one of the most segregated neighborhoods, Englewood in Chicago, one of the most segregated cities in America. She had certainly experienced enough racism that she didn't need Birmingham to teach her what was going on in America. In fact, she told me the story when she was in kindergarten, maybe first grade, um, at a school that was quickly turning from integrated to all black. She had a dear friend named Geraldine who one day went home for recess because she lived across the street. It was picture day at school. She had taken, brought home her family photo and back to the playground during recess and said to her best friend, Francine, are you white or are you the N-word? And Francine had never heard the word before, never heard anybody refer to her by that word before. And she didn't know how to answer it. But what she quickly realized was that her friend had gone home with the school photo and her mother had said, that's your friend, Francine? She's not white. And that was the end of their friendship. So this is the world in which Francine grew up. And yet at 19, when she sees the events in Birmingham, she decides, day before the March on Washington that she's going to go. She tells her mother and father, I've got to be there. She and her best friend pack backpacks. She said she packed a change of underwear, two bottles of Pepsi, and a clean shirt. And that was it. She and her friend got on the train and went to Washington. And she told her parents that it was. she felt like she had to go because she needed to hear Dr. King preach. She felt like it was important to see and hear this man. And she got there to the mall in Washington and felt like she had gone to church. And I would just want to read you what she told me as she heard Dr. King speak. She said, oh, we're really going to church now. The spirit had captured King and what a blessing it was to be there with him. What a blessing to receive these words that shone like a beacon, words that came out of the night and lit the darkness and showed you the way. Francine told me that she felt like King was in conversation with her that day, and that he was digging up past, digging into the quarries of memory, is how she put it. And King was reminding listeners that they had suffered, that their trust had been violated, but they had never given up, and they never would give up until this country lived up to its promise. She described the voice as being so big, and the audience as so big, that it shook her to her core. We are witnesses now, Francine told me. And we will take these words and make them a part of our own hearts and lives. We'll march and we'll go to jail and we'll carry these words with us forever. And these words will carry us. Francine felt like she had to do something that day. And she, a few years later, became a minister in the American Baptist ministry and continues that work today. So when I think about what King made effective, what made King effective, what made him so effective in Birmingham, I sometimes think we fail to listen to his own words. What did he tell us over and over? That he believed he was a preacher. He did not seek to become an activist, and he never really thought of himself as an activist. And when we think about his greatest campaigns, we sometimes fail to remember that they didn't go the way he expected. Right. Montgomery, well, you know, as Thurgood Marshall would tell you, it was the, uh, it was the lawyers that got, that got those buses desegregated. And what happened when King left Montgomery, when they tried to integrate the parks? Disaster. 
What happened in Albany? What happened in St. Augustine? What happened in Birmingham? The economic boycott didn't go as King planned. What worked was that King was preaching. He had this confidence in his own ability to put himself into these situations, not necessarily with a plan, not necessarily with a strategy, but with the ability to touch people's hearts and minds, to shine a light. The Bible says, ye are the light of the world. Let our light shine before men that they may see your good work and give glory to you, your Father who is in heaven. If King was at his most effective in Birmingham, maybe it's because that's where he shined his light the brightest. And as Dr. Banks said earlier, he showed that persuasion is possible. Letter from Birmingham jail. Persuasion. Taking a knee. Say my name, I am a man. Persuasion. Black Lives Matter. Persuasion. Shine a light. Persuasion, I think that's what King did best. Mm -hmm. accident that the Birmingham campaign occurs around Easter. Of all the things the Black Freedom Struggle was there, of all the things that it meant for King, and we've heard a lot of these over this week, it also represented a religious struggle, one over both the meanings and implications of faith. And that's what I want us to consider together in these few moments. As you all know, after the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955-1956, Alabama Attorney General John Patterson sought to suffocate the nation collective protest by outlawing the NAACP. But black Alabamians would not be cowed. Birmingham Minister Fred Shuttlesworth, I'm glad, Adam, that you talked about Shuttlesworth here, called local ministers to the Sardis Baptist Church where they officially founded the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, an organization committed to, quote, complete freedom. They proclaimed with, quote, unbowed heads, praying hearts, and an unyielding determination that hope was not dead. With its distinctly religious mission, the ACMHR, which soon included 55 churches. And we've talked about how some of them were middle-class churches didn't support King, but that means that some of these poor churches did. And they're drawing on a different source of power and a different logic, which we'll talk about. Um, these 55 churches, they organized direct action protests over the following years against segregation on buses and schools and rail stations, joining local movements in Atlanta, Nashville, and Albany, and partnering with national groups. Then, as we've heard, in 1963, Shuttlesworth, by then also an SCLC secretary, invites King to come to Birmingham. The April 3rd Birmingham Manifesto explained the group's intent to challenge segregation in the city. The patience of an oppressed people cannot endure forever, it began, before detailing the repeated violence inflicted not only by hoodlums, but facilitated by, quote, the blatant misuse of police power, the rantings and ravings of racist city officials. Calling for the city to act, Shuttlesworth in the Birmingham Manifesto, what he describes as this, quote, cry in the wilderness, invoked the shared lineage not only of the American dream of democracy in the Jeffersonian doctrine, that's his phrase, but also, quote, Hebraic Christian tradition, the law of morality. He and the ACMHR declared the Birmingham campaign then one of moral witness. Here's that word again. That witness embodied by the men, women, and children of the Birmingham campaign might, Shuttlesworth hope, act as a demonstration of redemptive hostility for black and white citizens. A demonstration that, as he said, quote, the beloved community can come to Birmingham. 
And we kind of are used to hearing the beloved community, but like he's saying that then. Um, what a radical thought. The beloved community comes in Birmingham. Brotherhood, sacrificial love, a holding up of the common life. He's saying that's going to come here. How could that happen, given the reality and history of the city? We think of John Lewis, who's just been there, of James Work, who's just had his head beaten in Montgomery. He, Shuttlesworth knows all of that stuff. Shuttlesworth knows it well. He's clear-eyed. He is sharp-tongued about the, quote, just grievances that the movement had. Black Alabamians, he described, had been, quote, segregated racially, exploited economically, and dominated politically. He still says the beloved community is coming to Birmingham. He himself, of course, has also suffered. He's been beaten. His wife gets stabbed. Some of you know this. His children are harassed when they try to integrate the school. His church is targeted. Um, I think it's a deacon who removes the bomb that's sitting outside his church. Um, and yet he insists on this hope, and he believes that it would come as a matter of faith. And for many, not just Shuttles, but for many in the freedom struggle, that faith was essential, offering a radical counter logic to the kingdom of God, a logic that eventually would vanquish Jim Crow imperialism. This was the upside down power of Christianity as fostered and celebrated in the black church tradition that offered no there's something maybe like this. If God had removed the wall of partition between divine perfection and sinful humanity, invented racial barriers could collapse. If humans had received reconciliation through the nonviolent, disinherited Jesus, of course, that's a Thurman term, what could not be reconciled by his spirit? If God sacrificed his son, might we let our precious children march around Kelly Ingram Park? The theology of redemption, of love, of resurrection, offered an enduring hope and a collective power. In 1956, in his famous Birth of a New Age address, King explained this eloquently. He says, the forces of darkness cannot permanently conquer the forces of light, and this is the thing that we must live by. This is the hope that all men of good will live by, the belief that justice will triumph in the universe. He calls this an eternal reminder of the truth that stands at the center of our faith. And that faith, as King explains, contains both radicalism and a sense of inevitability. Iniquity may occupy, this is how, how he puts it, iniquity may occupy the throne of force, but ultimately it must give way to the triumphant Jesus on the throne of Egypt. Evil may prevail against, sorry, evil may prevail again, and Caesar will occupy the palace and Christ the cross. But one day that same Christ will rise up and split history so that even the life of Caesar must be dated by his name. These are ideas treasured by many in the movement, prayed by grandmothers, sung in fields for generations, perhaps more simply, but no less powerfully. Yeah. Many white Alabamians would have also protested. The movement, while certainly appealing to legislators and the public through media, we've heard so much about this today, had at its core also a moral appeal to the conscience of its southerners, white Americans, especially those claiming to be Christians. As James Lawson put it in the SNCC Statement of Purpose, by appealing to conscience and standing on the moral nature of human existence, nonviolence nurtures the atmosphere in which reconciliation and peace become actual possibilities. The Nealon movement, in many ways, is, of course, the most direct of these moral spectacles, um, what Stephen Haynes calls moral spectacles. But, of course, as we know, as the prophet Zechariah states, calls for justice and kindness often produce this, this is a quote, the stubborn shoulder, the stopped ear, the diamond hard heart. That's from Zechariah 7. Throughout the months of the Birmingham movement, through the sit-ins at lunch counters and libraries, boycotts, mass meetings, marches, through the kneelings in churches, white citizens and powers would resist calls for justice. Instead, they arrested marchers, issued injunctions and court orders to stifle protest, unleashed the weapons of the state. But most disheartening and most enraging, of course, for the minister king, they theologized their callousness. 
The Klan certainly has its invented mythologies of a white Protestant nation, its violent obedience to a white God that would come to obliterate the 16th Street Baptist Church. And so did white religious moderates who sanctified segregation, twisting the words of Acts and Genesis to claim God the original segregationist. Or those who worshiped a God of order, the status quo. The stubborn shoulders and stopped ears and diamond hard hearts emerge, of course, with the eight religious leaders who call the movement in their April, April 12th open letter to King, quote, unwise and untimely. The mass meetings spilling from church to street, they call extreme. And these leaders wielded their religious authority in this theological project. Here's how they put it. This is in their open letter to King that he responds to, of course, from, from jail. He says, just as we formerly pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political traditions, we also point out that such actions as incite to hatred and violence, however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problems. And then they withdrew urgently. So they're wielding their theologies and their authority to kind of stifle this. This, of course, amounts to King's uh, grave disappointment that he expresses in his letter, his, quote, great disappointment for white church and its leadership. Segregation, he explains in the letter, borrowing from Martin Buber, Paul Tillich, from black intellectuals like George C. Kelsey and Howard Thurman and Will William Stewart Nelson, is, quote, morally wrong and sinful an existential expression of man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness. This segregation then must be opposed in obedience to the higher moral law. And for all that King is doing in this brilliant scrawled out letter, he is engaging in a theological argument. He says, I'm gonna read this passage too, I hope I'm not taking it. But he says, he's gravely disappointed. And he says, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux planner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your method, so direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating, he says, than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Or sense of tension, shallow understanding. Later, he'll ask in the letter, who is their God? And to the question of provoking violence, he says, isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing devotion to God's will precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? Like, if that's your logic, that you provoked violence, then like, let, let us consider the cross this Easter. Was not Jesus an extremist for love, he'll ask. Amos, an extremist for justice. And ask them, will you be an extremist for hate or for love? And there's no moderate option there. King, our theologian, does not leave a middle ground. Mm -hmm. He understood that there could be no faithful accommodation with the false gospel of white Christian nationalism. And the historical record bears this out. The white moderates, not the cessation they wanted when King agreed to the so-called truce agreement in May, and that very night, racist bombed the Gaston Hotel. The theological contestations over racial and religious meanings, of course, endure. As white Christian nationalists today, and Jonathan, thank you for showing those images this morning. Kind of like really helpful. So if we can kind of remember those, conjure those at, at describing this. These white Christians today proclaim to defend Christ, call for his blessing, they desecrate democracy and hoist the Confederate flag in the Capitol. And still they decry black extremism. 
The BLM movement radical demands for healthcare and childcare and education and access. Not only so, but many white Christians of all denominations obsessively invoke their own victimhood, insisting on a created nostalgia of their unchallenged power. Um, this is like example, everything is an attack on a white Christian way of life, this sort of persecution narrative. Nothing new. After the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, most white citizens in Birmingham immediately distanced themselves from the, quote, lunatic fringe, as Diane McWhorter put it. The mayor then issues a statement within 24 hours that, quote, all of us are victims and most of us are innocent victims. Addie Mae, Carol, Cynthia, Denise, like they can't even get 24 hours to be the victim of that. It's immediately all, oh, all these White, my, we are also victims of this lunatic fringe. So what, so what do we do? <laughs> What's needed is prophetic courage in the face of white Christian nationalism, a willingness to lament, to tell the truth, historically and presently, and take responsibility. The day after the church bombing, lawyer Chuck Morgan famously told the assembled business leaders who threw that bomb, we all did it. Um, and that, that means that this theological struggle must not be seated. As tempting as it may be to discard, as disappointing as King would certainly find our religious landscape. But the moral power of that rhetoric, the moral power found in faith, remains. So it can't just be seated to white Christian nationalists to claim Christ, to claim the Bible. To, that document is still breathing. Um, the radical Jesus cultivated and kept by the black church lives with great effect. And that stained glass window in the 16th Street Baptist Church, he's still there. And that face, we get to imagine what's there for us. There will be a cost for this propheticism and for faithfulness, one that faith leaders from Jamar Tisby to Rush Little Moore have borne. And so we must borrow hope from Fred Shuttlesworth, from King, to peer over the Jordan and keep it long. I want, to I want to thank all the panelists and um, this wonderful conversation and invoking the past. And, and many folks who you all mentioned are still with us today. And so before we move to our, our questions, I, I want to acknowledge that we are fortunate to have someone else with us today. And that is Mildred, Mildred Jones. And Mildred shared with us during the break that she was present at the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. And how the March on Washington inspired her as a teacher um, mm -hmm. to leave the march and get involved in organizing her local community. Please thank you for having me with us today. So with that, let's, let's turn to the questions. We have some students who are in the room, I noticed, and so I wanna make sure we have students who are making themselves known by turning away from me as I say that. <laughs> if we have any students who'd like to ask any questions about uh, this panel or anything else that we've talked about during this day and a half, I'd like to leave the floor before the students. Please go right ahead. I, I just want to say thank you to the panelists, and my apologies, I missed the past two sessions. I wasn't aware of them, but I'm happy to make the third. Um, the question um, I really liked, I was curious here at the end about how it's, um, the, the Civil Rights Movement really had this structure and reliance on um, like the Black Social Gospel Church, and like Howard Thurman sure enough, turning you know, Jesus into this. Like, uh, like a really uh, a symbol for, for movement, for like empowering this and so powerful and so um, necessary for the, the efforts made for the facilitation of just the continuance of the movement. I'm wondering, um, like looking towards today, what is, what is the, if any, if we have any, this is open to anybody, like the common mythos and the, the, um, the Bible of today that our, our movements rely on in terms of you know, like, like what are what are the inherent like what is these um, passed down um, tradition like we don't have a like a Zachariah like we don't have the, the books of the Bible <laughs> we're, like, we're not quoting our leaders say aren't quoting the Bible what, so my question is like what is it that's inspiring people today and like can we draw a parallel mm -hmm. that's a great question panelists want to jump mm -hmm. anyway 
I don't know the rhetoric, the, about rhetoric or anything, or about you know, Jorge's literature. I'll pull on your point of the, the, your uh, assertion that we don't have right those books. We don't have those Old Testament prophets. And just to say this, right, the, the zenith of American church uh, membership and participation, I think, was 1972 in terms of numbers of folks who were uh, you know, in, on, on the rolls uh, of churches. And, and so the, the sacred, secular sort of jostling that happens in public culture in any, um, any era we're, I think, I'm speaking as a lay person here, not as a black church scholar. Uh, we see a search for what, what else can serve as commonplaces along with scripture, given that like we talk about ideas of the social gospel. Even the, even the idea of common good has been under sustained attack for decades, right? And so that, that's one layer of what I see there in response to your question, even though it's not a real answer. It's Jorge, you want to go first? It's a great question. <laughs> and I do think, even as white Christian nationalism increases, the overall trend is secularization. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of institutional... Um, hemmed in project of churches on whatever side of political questions that's that's dissolving uh, but I do think in the meantime like I, I wouldn't I don't want to see that moral ground that religious moral ground um, I don't know what the other I actually don't know I would love to hear from others I don't know what a, a new common frame would be but I do I do think that insisting on moral it can't just be a fight for power. If, if, if we take, I think, Adam's claim seriously about black Twitter, I think that we can think about, even and take your bio seriously, I think we can think about hip hop artists existing in a similar space. And not just hip hop artists, but artists in general. Mm -hmm. If I think about black Twitter and during the days of Black Lives Matter following George Floyd, it felt like it was Kendrick Lamar. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we went broadly to the arts. It felt like it was James Baldwin. Yeah. And it wasn't just because I think people were writing books about Baldwin. It was almost as if a new generation had discovered Baldwin. Yeah, Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And Baldwin's yeah. quotes became, I mean, you can, you can look at this on Google and look at his mentions and Twitter. They skyrocket after yeah. George So I, I, would, I would submit that maybe it's to, to the black art tradition in mm -hmm. many ways that people are telling us. I would submit that as, as a thesis, as a hypothesis. I like that point. What I want to add to it, so first of all, where, where I want to take your question is, where does a black prophetic tradition connected to social gospel live now? It's going to take me a long time to figure that out. But in response to your point, so uh, anytime there was a, a mass kind of viral moment uh, I'll give you an example, speaking of hip hop. Uh, Meek Mill became a meme uh, across several different moments for little things. One was an image of him falling down the stairs or you know, several of these, right? And anytime there'd be one of these moments where the sort of family reunion happened on black Twitter, you know, who won Meek Mill versus Drake? The answer would be Twitter won. <laughs> so, so my point here is what happens in the real-time interaction in the exchange of a commons, even if it is uh, temporally bound, right? That that's where the life is. So, um, you know, I've, I've talked about social watching when people got together to watch Scandal or Insecure. I've talked about those as family reunion moments on Twitter or when there were big moments, you know, and so... Um, the life that happens in those everyday interactions is one place we can look for the truths that can become commonplaces. They ain't necessarily in the prophetic right. tradition. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I just think I, I really agree with you, I, especially with your point. So I, I was just on like what they call hip hop Twitter, especially <laughs> like peak during that you know, 2020, 2021 era. And I just feel like there's... Uh, I think there really is a, a semblance of, um, of this like 
eternal moral truth in a lot of the, what they call it conscious rap, which has a bad connotation today. Mm -hmm. um, but what I also found troubling was that um, a lot of those big voices, like the Kendrick Lamar's, the J. Cole's, were, um, they were having trouble with the, the, the media of, so, uh, the, the, whole, the entire premise of social media on Twitter. Um, and I was just wondering if you guys had any comments about how like that media itself, or like uh, the anonymity—sorry, anonymity, yeah, anonymity, sorry—of um, it all, and just like how our, our function and communicating with each other is just so different than it was before. I'm sorry, the, yeah, the, the, that, that might not be a question that can be answered like in the span of whatever I missed. Uh, I'll say the last question. You, yeah. This is, uh, yeah, is going to maybe take some slightly different direction, but this question really intrigues me, right? Because you know. I, the work I've done over as a teacher, I've often, a lot of people out of the Mississippi movement I've had come just hang out with my students and teach in my classes. And I'm always struck by, um, the students are all, you know, predictably there's a particular cohort of students who are more likely to end up in the And they always are turning to these elders to say, okay, how do we do this? What do we do? Tell us how you did it. And you know, part of what I always want to say you know, is that it, it kind of misses the point, right? That, that you, you don't make politics in the abstract or in a timeless fashion. You make politics within the specific historical context in which you find yourself. I mean, Snick was masterful of this. Think about how in the world would you begin to organize a voting rights campaign in the Mississippi Delta? I mean, oh my God, right? And yet they did. Bob Moses always talked about the crawl spaces. So you find the crawl spaces. He also talked about movements are bouncing a ball. What he meant by that was if you stand on the street and bounce a ball, children start to come up to see what you're doing. <laughs> and if their children come up, then pretty soon the parents start coming up wondering where their kids are. And, and, and in a sense, I think what he was trying to say to us was don't simply try to replicate you know, a, a model of what should look like. And so I, I find this really very fruitful, not that it's something I can particularly help with, but to actually recognize what are those spaces in which there is a commons, in which there is a public sphere, in which there are ideas or references that speak and that can be mobilized and tapped into to create rhetorical possibilities and, and unexpected solidarities that can encourage people to see something that they didn't see before. And you know, in the media landscape we are now, it's harder to understand how that would work because it's so fractured. And yet that should also be an again, that's much more your work at than mine. Yeah. Uh, so for all the beauty, the power, and the agency of what happens on black Twitter, and obviously that's gonna shift now into the X environment. Um, they're the moments that made folks like ta Coates say, I'm out. I've got to go because there's so much toxicity and there's so much bitterness and bile in the discourse uh, and, and people being attacked online and off. Uh, so, you know, back to not having a rhetorical situation, don't even have a moment to, to be able to present one's views and engage in good faith. That's just as real, right? And so what connects that to your, your invocation of hip hop, your invocation of the prophetic tradition of the church, part of what makes it so hard to look for that in, in the church now, black church and beyond, is the non-denominational stuff that's been going on for 40 years where, you know, and, and that's also connected to the movement of people. And so the, the idea of the neighborhood church does not exist in the same way. You have large churches that are in former malls, in huge parking lots, out in exurbs, that people drive from all over from. And so the church is not anchored in that same sense of community that, that we've seen in past eras, right? So I think that's really important. On the hip hop side, where you find the rebelliousness that, that we, at this point, almost even romanticize in some of hip hop now. We've got to look in some very different spaces than the large act artists. I think there's rebelliousness in Meg Thee Stallion. I think there's rebelliousness in Lizzo. Uh, and I, I do listen to both their music. 
that's probably a contained kind of rebelliousness, right? right. Uh, that's not the rebelliousness I'm going to use. And, and the same with Cole. Right. Side note, I have a friend who says he's tired of J. Cole submitting rough drafts for all his albums. I'm not a hip hop artist, so I can't judge that. But, but, but you know, it, are we going to take something from J. Cole to organize the voters' campaigns in an era of voter suppression? So, where do we find the rebelliousness that can lead to the organizing that you're both talking about? Other questions? Yes, please. No, I just wanted to observe that I think that um, this point about using using the kind of tools we have now, these new emerging tools, things like Twitter, where it's like new opportunities for rebellion, at the same time, recognizing where there's real, um, real potential, a kind of weapons that can against yes. continuing um, things. I mean, we were talking yesterday about the FBI, and, and I think it's vitally important to be aware of like political um, strategies and where these might be coming through, like fake news, uh, the idea of the white savior, yeah. um, kind of new uh, tactics that can be used in the same way that you know, white moderation, the, the idea of, of um, a kind of a, a, a made up one. Yeah, but you know, a discomfort that leads to taming not just figures, um, also artists. I mean, mm -hmm. you think about the eighties, how many were were tamed, and and this can't be used. It drays out because of all the things that are you know. You know. Um, so I think it's just important to you know be really aware of those. That, that probably brings you in, right, Jonathan? I mean, journalists have had to think about these changing landscapes in, in dramatic terms, right? You've got citizen journalism, you know, movement on one side. Like, what, what's your thought about being able to leverage these spaces while these power differentials and surveillance are still intensifying? I think uh, it's, it's similar to the problem with the church. We don't have the reach we used to have. There's not... It's, it's harder to get one message across. Yeah. There's less trust in the media. There used to be a sense that if you've lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, your newspaper was fairly reliable. You yeah. might be uh, a little bit more extreme on one end or the other than the publisher and the editorials. Yeah. They, were, they were fairly reliable and you could trust the news and you could debate it, but right. trusted your local newspaper. Yeah. And those local, local newspapers are gone, replaced by this very fractured, <laughs> You know, these silos that we all put ourselves in. So we we don't have as much opportunity to consider points that we might disagree with it to engage in them. We just keep listening to what we what we like. And that makes it harder for anybody to have a voice that gets heard you know, by a big enough audience. Crucial point, I think. Um, just to continue this conversation. So one of the powerful streams of framing and motivation was faith and religion. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the diminishing of that. Another one of those at the time was the idea of nonviolence. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that nonviolence came from different streams, from Gandhi, mm -hmm. from Bayard Rustin, yeah. from James Lawson. But the, the students who were finding their own way and finding a more radical way also affirm that student nonviolent for committee. That was their choice, their identity. And of course, that framing idea and commitment is seems to be highly diminished at this time. And it, it, it makes me wonder if, if if you know what you guys think about that. Yeah. And I do have one follow-up thought, which is that um, uh, there's a group. In, um, in Georgia, people probably know this, called the Black Voters Matter Fund. And they have a real interesting framing. They put it up on their, on their website. Uh, uh, Latasha Brown, you may know her. But they, say, they have a quote from King, and the quote they have is that, love without power is anemic, and a power without love is corrupt, yeah. abusive. So, Power and love, that's that's their framing. Power and love, power and love. So I want to know what you guys think. Just a quick thought. So when we think about the various social actions over, over the last decade in these cities that we've all named, they did, in my view, combine principles of nonviolence with an emphasis on direct action in that tradition that you're mentioning, and yet, 
how many people have ended up dead out of the Ferguson activism, right? And, and so where it, this is the same old playbook, it happened in the 50s and 60s as well, but we're, we're confronting intensified police power, not just the fact of police violence, increasing militarization of policing with the surveillance networks and the willingness to straight up disappear people and kill them. Uh, and so I say that to say, I don't know what effect, I know it's a chilling effect, but I don't know what effect that has on the ongoing commitment to nonviolence, as you mentioned it. I have more thoughts. Um, I think you're Ronnie Murray yesterday. He says suppression uh, can only, um, love can only endure suppression for so long mm -hmm. until it turns into the kind of Dave Dennis, you know, bitterness retaliation. This is a year in which nonviolence had reached a new level, a level that, and I think you captured it in King's, the, a level of coerciveness within the black community to observe this boycott, but of coercion against the business establishment of downtown Birmingham. Their goal was to shut the town down. Yeah. And um, that's very impolite. <laughs> it's very impolite. It's very incivil. It's a new language, as, as Bill Chafe said. Um, but we have to be careful about the conclusions that we draw from that. Because the core of nonviolence is that you're willing to absorb more evil than you are to dish out, yeah. right? And so you do not retaliate on the same level. Um, and I want to cite this op-ed by Tom Segrew last year, White America's Age-Old Misguided Obsession with Civility. There's a debate about civility and the types of protests, and he's talking back to the civil rights leaders who are saying it is illegitimate to block traffic, right, or to invade, invade spaces and be impolite. And I'm totally with him until he gets to this point where he says, you know, in Birmingham, angry black protesters looted Birmingham's downtown shopping district. This is not true. Operation Confusion on May 7th was nonviolent pandemonium. They had squads of people moving into the downtown around the police, singing freedom songs, running through the department stores, <laughs> singing freedom songs. They were not destroying property. That was not property violence there. And then, you know, Tom Segrew's got it wrong here. So they were drawing a line, but in a very extreme way that often got denounced as violent. SNCC, you know, SNCC was sort of thought to be the violent factor uh, of nonviolence. But this was Kingian nonviolence. This is what he, uh, Dave Garrow's, I mean, we don't have the concepts to really talk about this. Dave Garrow said he was moving from nonviolent persuasion to nonviolent coercion. I think he's moved, he's always done both, right? And the movement's always done both, but they're reaching a new level of civil disobedience and dislocating a city. And it didn't totally work, right? Sure. Because of this, and Shuttlesworth and King were not on the same page about when and how to, how to, how to, how to settle over how many job concessions, but they got desegregation, right, right out of that. So I'll, I'll stop here. Um, so this is an ongoing debate about what is a legitimate expression of democratic freedom when your uh, adversary is not listening, mm -hmm. right? And, and it has to do with right to occupy space, right to shout, and right to disrupt business and impose economic costs on you know, city. Um, and I think it, to its credit, it remains nonviolent until the bombing. Yeah, I just think, but also nonviolence, at least in James Lawson's initial vision and training of the students, there is a hope to transform. Yeah. And like part of it too, to your question about love and power, that those can be the same thing. And the students were also pretty intent on preserving their own sense of wholeness and their own sense of integrity and community in the face of dehumanizing segregation. And there is a sort of religious, nonviolent hope for transformation in their oppressors. And um, to do that requires a faith of some kind 
in a non-materialist reaction. And that feels harder today. I, does it? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I've been in Alabama too long, but I, I still think <laughs> there, you know, there, there's still a power in those old words and in those ideas and in those spaces, community spaces. And we talked about non-denominational churches. Well, what would it look like to have some prophetic non-denominational churches? Or what do you do with, like we talked about William Barber yesterday, you know, like th th there, there's still power in those things. And I, I really do not want um Nonviolent direct action progressive activists to seed that language. Look, I mean, I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more strongly, and, and and I feel the same way about Thomas Jefferson and Declaration of Independence, right? I mean, I think that there are really powerful rhetorical positions that we do well to use. The problem is, that, you know, we are living. I, I don't quite know how to. We're living in a world where people. Well, matter, I mean, we have become so tribalized that a perfectly unobjectionable statement, if it's made by somebody who is on the wrong team, will be denounced. I mean, I was thinking about this yesterday, biking home. Barack Obama went to Charleston to the funeral of the people who were murdered in the AME church there and sang Amazing Grace and was denounced by one of our political parties from the house tops for this kind of inappropriate sort of grandstanding. And if you're sort of thinking, by people who are in fact are wearing, donning the mantle of Christianity themselves, right? And if you think about, I mean, if this becomes, an, if this becomes something that doesn't crack through the walls of that, it's very discouraging. But I mean, I, at the end of the day, I, I think you're right. I, don't, I think there's no alternative but to use these rhetorical traditions, and I have to believe that they're still powerful. And I think, you know, one of the things we're talking about, you know, we're, we're treating this process of secularization, and I mean, I'm working on a little book now, right now, about black churches in Oakland. And, you know, the upshot of it is, is that everybody you talk to is like, the older people are like, nobody comes to our church anymore, what in the world's happening to our children? <laughs> And that process of secularization, I mean, is real, but it's not itself a secular fact. It is a consequence of certain other kinds of mm -hmm. political processes. Mm -hmm. And it's a consequence of, I think, the ways in which we have abdicated that space mm -hmm. to people who are, I mean, the ostensive definition of the scribes and Pharisees of mm -hmm. the Gospels, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we, I think, so I couldn't agree with you more, even in this age of secularization, uh, the, the percentage of American people who profess, broadly speaking, to be Christian is exceptionally high. It's like an order of magnitude higher than some of the other modern industrial Western democracies. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a resource we should be able to use rather than see feel I, I have one other small thing, and this is that it's not just a rhetorical power, but it is an embodied power. And we're, we're one of the main crises that young people are facing, young people who the, the higher numbers of secularization, all this is loneliness and like the need for community, the need for like embodied relationships. And so for everything that the technology offers, like we need spaces where people can be known and cared for. And that is what the movement drew from these like generational spaces where people had had um, family and care and sucker in, in grief. And like, actually people still need that. So it's a rhetorical thing, but it's also an embodied thing. Sorry, Jim. And that was your, I don't know if you, I didn't hear you talk this morning, but the thing you wrote mm -hmm. about what you tapped into the Jesuit, sure. the Jesuit yeah. tradition is precisely about that. It's about caring for one another as the fundamental obligation. That's love can, can I follow up? But I don't want someone else has a question. Uh, let me let me follow up with you because um, I love the way you know. One word that's come up a lot in the last hours about this about rhetoric, about language, how you frame language. I, I love that, and I want to think about it in terms of faith because when we look at the people in those pictures I showed earlier, yes. that there's Christian, for example, broad spectrum of people who call themselves Christian. Right. But if you look at, you know, I'm thinking of Yates, if you think of mm -hmm. the people who have passionate intensity about their faith, how do we respond when the most passionate, intensely faith
faithful people are the extreme white nationalists. Right. Yeah, yeah. How do we get our passionate intensity to respond? Wow. That's a pretty dark thought. The best <laughs> lack all conviction and the worst are filled with passion. Yeah. Yeah. Beast. Yeah. Well, we're at time, but we can't end on that. <laughs> end on that. Uh, okay, so I'll offer an example. One, two. So, you know, our former president, in all of his rhetorical brilliance. Which one? <laughs> uh, president Obama. <laughs> I would never claim the other guy, right? No, no but so, so to my point, though, he he might have invoked the the prophetic tradition sometimes in delivery in cadence. Yeah. Didn't really invoke the substance of the prophetic yeah. tradition, right? That wasn't him, right? Former first lady, first lady for life. She did a little bit more sometimes, and especially in the campaign in the early part of the first term, you could even see some distance in the positions she would take publicly and those that, that Barack would take. Where am I going? Despite that, there is there are moments like the book uh, Go Tell Michelle, where black women of all you know kind of um, occupations, places in the world, say, this is what we want you to take from us into these conversations that you step into. And, and those entries do carry some more of a notion of a social gospel, of a common good, and, and, and maybe even in an excerpt or two, a little bit you know, close to the prophetic, um, you know, some of the black women preachers and pastors who have, they, they get the, you know, some more denominations are ordaining uh, now, right? But sometimes you'll get these seminary trained black women preachers and they'll send them, despite all their training and their, their uh, qualifications, to the small church that they were about to leave for day where, you know, somebody who is not seminary trained and doesn't come with these other credentials gets the larger appointment, you know. So in, in the preaching of some of those folks, you know, we can find parts of what you're calling us to pick up. So I, I just wanted to offer a little bit of an upswing. Women, women may save us. <laughs> and also, like, this is unexpected. Like, I think remembering what Fannie Lou Hamer was up against mm -hmm. yeah. and what you know, what a young John Lewis, like he's so, he's from, you know, Pike County, Alabama. Like they, there's the passion and intensity of that imperial racist project. Like they could not have been up against stronger forces and yet they harnessed what they had and the moral power. And, and then they also preserved their own dignity and called on their own. And, and then this word sacrifice that King calls on them to do. They were like, we'll do that if we have to do it. But like, you know, Fannie Lou Hammer, if I die, I'll go five feet, what is it, five feet, five inches forward. forward. Yeah. And so, you know, I, that's where we can begin. You need underground spaces to get you a Fannie Lou Hammer, though. Yeah. yeah. Gosh, this is this so much, brother, because you got you to bring the hope, brother. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if James Baldwin ever lost hope that white people would trade their whiteness for humanity. Um, but he said they needed to stop needing the N-word in order to do that. They had to ask themselves deeply why we historically have needed to degrade these people, right? And I don't think he gave up that hope, right? And I don't know if we've overcome, but I think we've come a long way. However dire the situation is now, there is a community of humanistic people, <laughs> and you've brought some of them together right here. So you want to all join me and sing We Shall Overcome? Or, or, uh, or B.B. King's Midnight Believer, right? Soon after a knock at midnight, B.B. King released, I think, maybe 65, Midnight Believer. And so that's a trope worth playing with. I got something, too, but, but you oh. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that goes along with the, the idea of hope, uh, it's actually the idea of redemption, so the idea that like no one is ever too far gone. It's actually interesting, like, of the eight who were, wrote the thing that King responded to, seven of them had pretty yeah. reactions to it, and 
a lot of them felt persecuted by like, oh my God, why was I singled out for this? Um, but there's one person, uh, Joseph Durek, um, and he ends up in Memphis in 68. Um, and when given a second chance, he endorses the strikes going on. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of those things where it's interesting, right? Because again, you think of the trajectory, you think of all people, he has the same right to be like, oh my gosh, why was I singled out? Um, but in those five years, he, right? Those are redemptive moments. Yeah. And so it's just one of those things which there's always the potential for people to surprise. Which... The only thing I'll say about this is just that I mean, it feels incredibly bleak. There's no question about this. But part of why our politics feels so bleak and so dysfunctional is we may be living through the death throes of a particular kind of movement. Mm -hmm. This is minority rule, right? We've created, you know, and, and, the, and the complexity of our democratic system is built in to protect minority rights. Yeah. It was, that was one of its great innovations of the 18th century, and we have never in our lives seen that as we weaponized as effectively as we mm -hmm. yeah. So, in the state of Ohio, tickets to vote were tomorrow, and everybody in the state across it voted 50-50. There would be 13 Republican Congress people right. and two Democrats. State of Wisconsin consistently is voting 56, 57, 58 percent Democrats and is locked with a Republican Party majority that is utterly unshakable. And 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 so in, in some sense, in all of these elections, I mean Joe Biden won the election by like seven million votes. This was one of the great landslides in American history. And so part of, I think, what it is, is you know, we're fighting uphill now because we're, and we're now with the absurdity where literally one congressman can single-handedly stop our entire government from operating. Single-handedly. So this is like the ridiculous out of certain moments. But it doesn't necessarily mean that this is where the country is as a whole. And, 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 I, and so I think, you know, one of the things King, was, King believed in it's voting, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what the people in Philadelphia, Mississippi, got murdered doing. It was a voting rights campaign, mm -hmm. and I just really feel like, you know, in the first Trump election, the, the out, the voter turnout of Stanford undergraduates—we don't have it exactly—was estimated to be about one third. Right. And and I just think, you know, I really do think if, for all the stuff that we've been talking about here about finding crawl spaces and organizing rhetorical traditions. One of the things that this movement left us was a voting mm -hmm. That has been narrowed, although the recent Supreme Court cases suggest it's not been narrowed as much as we thought. And I just think that's one of the ways is we should take mm -hmm. forward. We just have to vote. There's more of us. That's why they're so scared. Mm -hmm. That's exactly why they're so scared. Mm -hmm. Why they're resorting to yeah. self-delusional power grabs. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm, I'm going to close this out. We can continue the conversation. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>Colleagues who are here, David, Tanisha, Regina, and um, in, in absence is with me, Bryn and Megan. Um, and we're, we're Jackie. Jackie, Jackie. <laughs> right behind me, got my back, thank you. We want to um, thank you all for, for coming out to this event. Um, and we hope that this will be the beginning of an ongoing conversation. Um, we look forward to celebrating with all of you when the volume is released, and, and we also look forward to maybe next year gathering again to think about 60 years um, since- 64. <laughs> 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 That's right. So again, thank you all for coming. With this, this concludes our conversation. I want to thank the students for your wonderful, provocative questions and for coming, and I want to thank all of you who traveled so far to be here and everyone who came and stuck through and supported us all. So we will continue the conversation if you want in the hallway. But again, thank you all. Thank you, Jackie, for getting us all together.
I'm just thinking about memory.